Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am working from home once again, as you can see. Uh, today's video is going to be a little bit different. I was uh, contacted a while ago, um, probably, I don't know, six or so weeks ago by a jewelry brand called Anna Luisa. And they wanted to do a sponsored video, which is really cool. But I was initially kind of skeptical because it's a jewelry brand and this is not a fashion channel. This is an art channel. Uh, but I took a look at their stuff and what they make and learned a little bit about them. And I actually really liked the style of their pieces. And uh, I even, even more, I liked the fact that they were a, um, a sustainable business and that they had made sustainable a big part of their business model and their practices. So like they only use um, recycled or sustainably sourced materials and all of their packaging is eco-friendly, which is just really cool. Um, but still I was trying to think of like, how can I make this connect with the channel or how can I do this in a way that feels authentic to the channel? Cause that's something that's really important to me. So I ended up suggesting an idea that uh, seemed a little bit crazy and they had never heard of before, but they were uh, open to it. Uh, I suggested that they, uh, instead of just uh, sponsoring a video and having me do a quick mention to something that had nothing to do with the channel, that they would actually commission me to make an illustration and uh, let me share the whole process of that uh, from start to finish with you guys. If you've watched this channel for a while, you'll know that I used to actually do this sort of video fairly frequently where I would show the entire uh, process of creating a piece from start to finish and kind of explain what I was doing and, and uh, bring you guys along for that. And I just just really haven't been able to make as many of those kinds of videos recently because so much of the work that I do is under non-disclosure agreement. So I am really excited to be able to uh, make one of those kinds of videos again and actually share the whole process from start to finish with you guys. So thank you so much to Anna Luisa for commissioning me to make this illustration and um, sending me such beautiful pieces. So I am going to be using my typical mixed media technique. Uh, the only thing that's really different is that I am working from home so you'll see that the setup is a little bit different. I'm not going to be on my drafting table, but I'll be using um, my same techniques, uh, the same process that I usually do, and I'll explain uh, what I'm doing at each phase of the process. So uh, before we dive into that, I do want to show you the pieces that they sent me and explain to you why I chose to paint the one that I chose to paint and uh, what I like about it. So once we decided to move forward with this idea, Anna Luisa asked me what style I liked, and I told them that I generally gravitated towards more minimal pieces, uh, and I chose a few examples of the things that I liked from their website. They ended up sending me four different pieces of jewelry, and even though I like all four of them, I was pretty sure that even before the pieces arrived, I'd end up painting the ring. I really liked that it was a bezel style, which is what my wedding ring is, and I love the really thin, delicate band. Also at a baseline level, uh, in terms of the artistic process, I knew that it would just make for the best illustration. It's the most dimensional out of all of the pieces. And honestly, I just really wanted to tackle the challenge of that faceted blue stone. Okay, so here's the reference image that I'll be using. Okay, so just getting started here, I have my drafting board on my left since I am painting in a chair and not at my drafting table. And I've got my uh, little sketch, which is actually just five by seven taped to my drafting board. What you can't see is in front of me, I have a little stool that has um, some of the colors I'm gonna be using, my watercolors and my watercolor palette and my reference photo. My reference photo, I um, will ask Meg to pop up here on the screen so that you can see it. So you won't be able to see me mixing the color, but um, I am just using watercolor for the base layer and uh, I'll have to look and see. I can't remember which brush this is, but I think it's like a size four or five maybe and uh, just applying a base of watercolor all across the metal part of the ring and um, I've kind of blocked out where the different shadows and highlights are but I am going to go ahead and apply this color more or less uh, across the entire surface area of the gold part because this is essentially as light as it's going to get. There are a few little places where it will be lighter where there will be actual white highlights, but for those, um, I should be able to just do white color pencil on top and that's not gonna be a problem. All right, now I am headed in with a bit of a darker color. This is basically the same color that I was just using with a little bit of purple added in. And I'm doing this to try to tone down the saturation of some of the areas. It's not a ton darker, but it is somewhat darker as you can see, and it's much, much less saturated. So I'm just going over all of the desaturated and darker areas with this color and the areas that I really want to get 
um, quite a bit darker in value, not just desaturated. I'm going over a second time or using a more concentrated version of the color. All right, and now I am going in with just a straight raw umber and I'm hitting all of the areas that are really, really dark and trying to really give the object that uh, sense of being reflective and metallic. And as you can see, there's really a pretty significant value difference in how dark this is compared to the other parts of the metal. And that's intentional. That's what's going to give it the sense of being, uh, yeah, being a metallic reflective object. All right, at this point, I'm uh, pretty much done with what I'm going to do for the base layer of the metal part of the ring. And now I'm going to start on the uh, blue stone, which is the whole reason, well, the biggest reason I wanted to draw this piece in particular. I just love all of the facets of it and I uh, think it's so beautiful with like light reflected in it and I've wanted to draw stones and gems uh, for quite a while. I, I did do a couple initially way back when I was first getting started but I've never done a cut gem so uh, this is my first time attempting this sort of subject and I'm starting with uh, the lightest square, the, the square that's kind of the highlight in the stone and that looks like it's a cooler blue to me so I'm going with a lighter cooler blue and then all of these other stone all these other facets rather uh, look like they have a bit more warmth in them so I'm going to darken these up quite a bit but I am just starting with an initial underlayer that has a, a lot more warmth in it this is uh, I think a cobalt turquoise that I'm using that's I've knocked down the saturation a tiny bit, but it's mostly just a straight cobalt turquoise. And then around the edge here where things are really, really dark, I'm going in with, um, this is ultramarine with some cadmium orange hue uh, that's mixed in to knock down the saturation and to darken it. And I'm going in pretty much full strength here. This isn't watered down very much because I want it to be really, really dark. I'm just trying to get all of those shadow areas in. And I'm basically doing the same approach the same strategy that I had with uh, the metal part of the ring where I am covering the large surface areas so I'm kind of identifying the big blocks and anywhere that there's going to be a big block of uniform color that's where I am applying color first and then I will kind of subdivide and subdivide and subdivide and get more nuanced with the color later on. All right, and then just finishing up with this first layer here, I'm going in with some almost pure ultramarine blue here. This again will get darkened, but it looked uh, it looked really a lot more saturated than the other dark areas. So I'm putting a, a pure color down uh, so that it, that'll give me a good base to work from. And then while it's still wet, I am dropping in a bit of the desaturated ultramarine that I used uh, around the edge of the stone and that's gonna help me create a gradient. And I'm actually gonna do a version of this technique across a lot of the other facets of the stone when I wanna uh, give something a gradient effect, the kind of wet on wet working. So when you're doing wet on wet, you have to remember that anytime you lay pigment down, it's going to just be drawn into wherever the paper is wet. So that's why I'm starting with one square, then jumping over, waiting for the initial square to dry, then going back and doing the other ones that are next to it. So uh, you have to kind of think strategically when you're going to do Sorry if you can hear that screaming in the background. That's the girls playing. Yes, if you're going to do the wet on wet, you have to think strategically about uh, what part of your piece you work on when to make sure that the areas that are around it, the different planes and fields that are around it are dry in order to give you uh, control over it. And if you don't care about that, if you really want the super messy organic look and you don't need as much control, then I guess you don't have to worry about it quite as much. But if you're aiming for a realistic look with watercolor and using wet on wet, uh, the key is to really be controlled in what areas you work from, and what areas you allow to be wet and which ones you wait uh, to work from until they're dry. All right, just continuing that across all the different facets here. Some of them I'm darkening up a bit. Some of them I'm tweaking the color and the temperature. And I'm just gonna work my way around the edge of the stone one final time with a really, really dark desaturated blue. I could definitely do this part with a colored pencil with like almost a black colored pencil, but I'll get a crisper line with a watercolor. So I wanna have that down first. All right, and since you didn't get to see it initially, here is the little working space that I have set up. You can see what um, a kind of cluttered mess this is, but uh, this is what we're working with in these uh, times where I am stuck working at home. So I um, thought you guys would enjoy um, seeing that or hope you would enjoy seeing that, but you can see uh, the different colors that I've used up there and then the palette. And um, 
I have my little blotter pieces of paper that I used for uh, testing the colors that I've mixed. All right, now all done with the watercolor. So I'm going to move on to colored pencil and uh, I'm starting again on the metal part of the ring. The main reason I'm starting on the metal part this time around is because it's gonna be much less likely to pick up color and smudge. And I didn't bring the pieces of paper that I usually use to, to rest my hand on. Uh, and we don't have anything like that around the house. Um, we don't have a printer in the house anymore right now because the printer was mine and came with me to the studio. So anyway, I am trying everything I can think of to avoid any smudges and I'm definitely going to get more saturated and darker with the stone so anytime you have laid down more pigment that's when it's more likely to pick up on your hand and smudge so uh, I'm not going to lay as much down here on the metal so I'm starting with that and uh, initially I'm using kind of a cool gray to go over some of those desaturated areas since they actually still feel a bit too warm to me and then I'm going to be using a combination of some French gray and some different ochres and even um, kind of a greenish color. I think it's called green ochre actually, or maybe it's artichoke, but it's one of those desaturated kind of gold green colors that Prismacolor has. And uh, at this point I am working on blending out fades and the gradients and the connections between the different areas of color. And then I'm also trying to add more complexity since the underlayer looks roughly metallic, but there's not, there's not a lot of nuance. There isn't a lot of like, kind of back and forth between warm and cool and saturated and desaturated. So I'm trying to add uh, quite a bit of that here and I'm just working my way across the, the surface of the ring doing that. Just continuing to work my way across the band and all the metal parts of the ring. I'm using everything I've laid down so far as a guide and uh, kind of pushing the colors that are already down further in uh, the direction that they need to go in. So the areas that have been desaturated some already, I'm desaturating a bit more. And I'm also adding some gradients where the really dark areas connect to the lighter areas and some saturation as well. All right, just adding the finishing touches on the band and I'm gonna move on to the stone. Okay, so overall the stone actually looks closer to how I ultimately want it to look in the end than the band or the ring did. With the band I knew I had quite a lot of development to do. With the stone I feel like it's, um, it's actually kind of nearly there. So this is going to be more about nuancing and uh, just tweaking the colors slightly to get them closer to where I want them to be and to sharpen up some of the edges and, and just make it look more polished and finished. So I'm using a combination of some lighter blue. I think I'm using sky blue, Prismacolor sky blue. And then I have cobalt blue and um, ultramarine violet, I believe, and then indigo, uh, several different blue pencils. Basically I have some warm blue and some cool blue and some dark blue and some light blue. And I'm just kind of following along with what I had laid down initially in each of these little facets, trying to create gradients that go from one end to another. And where I feel like it needs to push a little bit towards the warmer side, I'm using the, uh, the warmest blue, which is actually more of a turquoise or a teal. And then when I feel like it needs to go cooler, I'm using the things that are more ultramarine or more violet. And uh, indigo blue, I have such a complicated relationship with this color blue. I feel like Prismacolor actually doesn't have my ideal dark blue. So I usually end up having to kind of go back and forth between indigo and one of the cool grays. But uh, in this case, I feel like indigo is actually working really well. And that's probably because the issue I usually have with it is that it feels too saturated to me for a dark color. But uh, given that this is a blue stone, a blue quartz, uh, I actually want it to be fairly saturated. So um, the indigo is working well. And then whenever I'm laying it down over the dark areas, the saturation doesn't come through quite as much. But when I'm laying it down over the, the lighter areas that need to be darkened up some, but I don't want them to get too gray, it's working really well. Yeah, so as you can see, there is just not a lot to do on the stone because I, I did a lot more development with the watercolor and got a lot closer to how I wanted it to look. Uh, so at this point, I am switching to uh, the Prismacolor white colored pencil. I'm going to kind of start clarifying some of the highlights. So I'll use this white colored pencil wherever I want there to be softer highlights. 
So I'm doing some here in the stone, trying to create some of these little more subtle reflections and maybe even lighten up some of the edges of the different gradients. And then I'm gonna use it on the metal to again, create the softer reflections. I will come back, uh, excuse me, the softer highlights. Uh, I will come back and use uh, the Sharpie paint pen as you'll see in a moment for hard highlights, but um, I almost always like to go in first with the white Prismacolor colored pencil to kind of block out where I want my soft white highlights. All right, and now here I come with the Sharpie paint pen to uh, put in some of those um, harder, brighter white highlights, mostly in the metal, but a few little spots in the stone as well. All right, I'm nearly done, but I've had just a last minute decision to um, go ahead and add a little bit of a drop shadow. So I'm using uh, cool gray in the 10% and 20% concentrations, going in uh, mostly with the, the 20% kind of softly, I'm not pressing too, too hard. Uh, and then I'm fading out the edges with the 10% since it's, it's so light, it almost appears white. And I really want this to be a very subtle drop shadow. I don't want anything um, too, too intense. And by the way, I don't think I've mentioned this this whole time that I've been working, but I'm working on a really smooth, uh, hot pressed, heavyweight watercolor paper. Okay, and uh, there is the finished piece and there it is with the ring. Um, I will have Meg put up a scan as well so you can see what that looks like. All right, so that is about it for this video. Thank you again to my wonderful sponsor, Annalisa, for commissioning me to create this illustration and letting me share this whole process with you guys. If you wanna take a look at their jewelry line, uh, please check out the link in my description box, www.annalisa.com backslash Kendall. And you can see the whole offering of things that they have. Uh, they're running a special Mother's Day sale right now. Um, so definitely take a look if you like that style, if you're looking for um, something for your mom or for some other special person in your life. Okay, so wrapping up here, uh, thank you so much to Meg for editing and to my patrons for uh, sponsoring this channel and supporting this channel. Um, thank you to all of you for watching. I hope you are hanging in there and um, doing whatever you need to do to take care of yourself during these crazy times. So um, I am thinking of you guys this week and I will see you in the next video. Bye.